All right, welcome everybody. Um, a couple of things to think about logistically. Your project four was due yesterday. If you didn't finish it, you still use late days, finish it by tonight or tomorrow. Your homework seven is due today. Your homework eight is coming out soon and will be due early next week. And then project five, Ghostbusters, which we'll see some preview of today, uh, is coming out likely tomorrow and will be due next week, Friday. So a lot of things coming up. So topic of today's lecture is actually we're going to switch to machine learning. But before we do that, we have a couple of things to still cover about HMMs that weren't covered yet in the previous lecture. And it's the topic of dynamic base nets. So we looked at in previous lectures something called HMMs, where you have a temporal process over time, a state, an observation, you might not observe the state, and you somehow estimate a distribution over possible state values. We're going to refine that right now. So now, instead of tracking one state variable, we're going to want to track multiple variables over time. So this is the big difference here. Multiple vari variables, and there could be multiple evidence variables too. The key idea will be that we'll repeat a templated base net structure over and over at each time slice, just like we did for HMMs, but it can be a little more complicated now. So let's look at an example. Let's say you were in a maze and there could be two ghosts in the maze, but you can't see the ghosts. But you can measure things related to where they might be. And so that's what this would represent over here. Ghost A and B are in some location that's unknown, but you might have some measurement about where they might be. Maybe a color of your sensor in a certain location. The sub-index here is time. So this is for time one. And so what we'll look at is what happens as we go from time one to time two. The ghost could move, and this part of the base net here encodes the dynamics of the ghosts. For example, this is saying where ghost A will be at time two depends on where ghost A was at time one, but also depends on where ghost B was at time one. For ghost B, it's saying where ghost B is at time two depends on where ghost B was at time one, but also where ghost A ended up at time two. So ghost B kind of makes a decision right after ghost A can condition on what ghost A did. And then these are again evidence variables of where the ghosts might be. This is your sensor model. And this repeats over and over and over. Just like in an HMM, we have the same structure over and over, but now it can be any templated base net that gets repeated over and over with a dynamics model living in the top here, an observation model living at the bottom. Let's take a, let's take a look at um, your project See your project five, it'll be. So here's what your project five looks like. You're controlling Pac-Man. You are in what looks like an empty maze, but actually there are four, four ghosts in the maze. You just don't know where they are. The game is a little bit reversed. You're not just Pac-Man, you're Grandpac. Grandpac is not afraid of the ghost. In fact, Grandpac chases ghosts as a sport. And, but Grandpac can't see. And that's why we don't see the ghosts. Um, but Grandpa can vaguely hear some stuff every now and then. And based on that, maybe determine where some ghosts might be. And that's what's will, what will be encoded in your observation model. And so Grandpa over there, top left corner. This is me playing with the keys. I know there are four ghosts, I'm trying to find them. At the bottom right, you can see how far away I think, or this measurement suggests they are. 
Um, they're not super close. Let's see if we can get closer to one of them. The red one seems pretty close. There we got it. When we find the ghost, we actually win in this case. Put it in its ghost jail down there. Um, let's go to another one. Let's see. Getting closer to the orange one. Maybe not. Maybe we are. It's pretty hard to find. Maybe it moved somewhere completely else by now. Oh, we're so close. Yeah, we got it. And so you can see how this is actually pretty difficult to play. If all you do is look at the measurements at the bottom, <laughs> sometimes the ghost is stupid enough to just run into you. Their, their motion is not conditioned on where you are. So you might have some luck. Um, if we sit there long enough, the blue one might come with us too. But this is, this is really hard to play just based on the raw observations here. And so what you'll be implementing is a filtering algorithm that tracks where the ghosts might be, and then you can implement a strategy on top of that that might go look where they could be, track down the ghosts, and then put them in jail. Now, if you do this naively with an HMM, and there are four ghosts, then your state space becomes very large very quickly. Every, every ghost has, let's say, about 100 possible locations, so that state is now 100 to the power four possible values you can take on. But we know there is structure, we know there is four separate ghosts, and so when we use dynamic base nets, we explicitly expose that structure to get more efficient algorithms. Just like in standard base nets, we work with a base net rather than with a full joint distribution, because a base net can be more effective to reason with than just a full joint distribution. The blue one still didn't come to us. Let's just try to catch it for fun here, see where it is. Somewhere around here, might be too hard. Oh, so close. Oh, run out of time. Okay, <laughs> didn't win this one. Okay, so one thing we could do is we could run exact inference in a dynamic business. What that means is we'd be unrolling the network over time. When we do that, the dynamic basenet turns into a standard basenet. So even though a dynamic basenet consists of a template where this thing over here is just copied over here and so forth, you have the same set of parameters everywhere, we can still unroll it, make it a one big basenet, run any inference procedure that we like. Maybe you want to run variable elimination, maybe likelihood weighting, maybe add something else. Um, so that's one option. That's always available to us. And so that might allow us to infer maybe something about where the ghost is at a certain time. We'd want to do this in a fashion that runs left to right. So effectively what we'd be doing is we'd be running variable elimination, eliminating G1A, then G1B, and so forth, moving from left to right, always having the latest distribution over current locations of the ghost. A lot like the forward algorithm in HMMs was just variable elimination run in a particular variable ordering. In practice, often this is too expensive, and so you might want to generalize the idea of particle filters to dynamic base nets. Really important idea here. A particle in a dynamic base net is a complete sample for a time step. So when we have four ghosts, a single particle will represent location of all four ghosts. So we don't have a separate particle per ghost. We have one particle representing all ghosts. You might have more than one particle, but each individual particle will have all ghosts in it. The reason you want that is because that way you can model interaction between them. If they interact, for example, these ghosts tend to stay away from each other to cover the board. If you put them all in a single particle together, then when you do a transition, you can capture that interaction. Algorithmically, the way it works is you would generate some prior samples from the base net at time t equals one, which is standard prior sampling. For elapsed time, you would just forward propagate one variable at a time. So you'd say, okay, I take one ghost variable, I sample it from its parents, take another ghost variable, sample it from its parents, work through all of them. Then we observe the evidence, 
And again, important to look at the details here. The way the evidence is observed is by multiplying together the probability of each of the evidence variables. So this is a multiplication here. And the entire product, if there were four ghosts, it would be four terms here if you had four measurements, one for each ghost, all multiplied together into the likelihood of that particular particle. And then you resample to make sure you get a dis good distribution of where your particles are. You don't have a lot of computation spent in places with very low weight and your computation going to waste. Any questions about this? You'll be implementing this in your project five this coming week. Okay, then let's switch over to the third section of the course, which is machine learning. So until now, what, it did, what we've looked at is decision making. There is a model, and based on the model, you compute what a good decision might be. It could be that the model is probabilistic, and we know how to work with that, that was part two. In machine learning, we're actually going to worry about how to acquire this kind of model that we've been using, or even other models, from data, from experience. We've done a tiny little bit of this when we looked at reinforcement learning, where we acquired a transition model from data, and we looked at acquiring a value function, a Q function from data, but mostly so far we've assumed the models are there with us and just learn how to use them. What could you learn? One thing you could learn is parameters. Let's say you know roughly what the model should be, but you don't know the details. Then you could, hopefully from data, fill in the parameter values that are best suited to your problem, to your environment. You can learn structure. Maybe you're not so sure what the graph structure of your base net should be. If somebody gives you data, can you infer what the right graph structure of your base net should be? In fact, with the right algorithms that exist, yes, you can. It's not easy, but it's possible. Might also be interested in learning hidden concepts. For example, let's say you are Google and you are trying to present news stories. Many news outlets will cover the same stories. And so when you present, <laughs> the, bless you. Uh, when you present the latest news of the day, you don't wanna just enumerate all these news stories one after the other, you wanna cluster them together by topic. And so there you're actually learning the structure in the data automatically discovering what is similar to what and then able to present things in a more interesting way to people, then people can look at it and make decisions, whereas in the first two it's often the other way around where you might try to show the system how you make decisions that you wanted to learn from that to make similar decisions. Today we're going to look at a very special or a very specific type of machine learning. We'll look at model-based classification and we'll see a lot more about that soon. And within model-based classification we'll look at na the naive Bayes approach to doing model-based classification. Okay? But a lot of the concepts that we'll cover are actually very general and applicable to many machine learning approaches, and we'll see that in the next few lectures as we build on this. So what's classification? In classification, you're given something, and you're supposed to put it in a bin, some type of bin. For example, maybe you are a computer program that's helping people manage their inboxes, and you are supposed to classify whether a message is Spam, then well, ham. Where spam is a thing people don't want to see, ham is better than spam, is a thing people do want to see in their inbox. So how would you build a system like this? So input is an email, and the output of the system is going to be spam or ham. The setup in classification tends to be that the first thing you get to do is get a large collection of example emails. These will often in the future called training data. It's a concept that will come back a lot. So you get example emails. Each of them is labeled as ham or spam, whichever category it belongs to. Note that somebody has to go in and do this. Who might do this? Well, if you have a classification problem you want solved, maybe you put the data up somewhere on Amazon Mechanical Turk and you pay people to label your data. Maybe if you're clever, you find a way for people to label it for free. You provide an email service, you provide a button, and people see something as spam, they might label it themselves, because they have an incentive too, because it'll improve the way they receive their email. But ultimately, you need a mechanism, that's always a starting point here, 
that gives you labeled data. And then the goal is that we want to learn to predict labels of new future emails that we haven't provided labels for ourselves. The way we abstract the email is by extracting out features. So we won't present our learning artem with straight up an email or maybe a picture of an email. Instead, we'll present it with some things that we think matter about that email. So for example, what words appear? You might say a very simple spam filter could say, if the word free appears capitalized, it's spam. I'm gonna put it in spam. It's probably not the right thing to do because maybe one of your friends found this really great deal and is sending it to you and you still wanna see it. But it's indicative of that it's more likely to be spam than ham, so it's something you might wanna extract. Text patterns. If dollar amounts appear, again, maybe you think that's indicative of more likely being spam. If things are all caps or there's a lot of caps, again, maybe it's likely to be spam. Um, there could be non-text features. For example, what if the sender of the email is in your contact list? And it's less likely to be spam. And so there's a lot of things you could come up with, and that is often an art. It takes a lot of practice, a lot like heuristic design for A star is an art, to come up with the features that might matter. Let's take a look. Dear sir, first I must solicit your confidence in this transaction. This is by virtue of its nature as being utterly confidential and top secret. Spam or ham? Spam? Well, yeah, most of us would not want to get this email. It's kind of a useless email, somebody trying to get something from us. Next one, to be removed from future mailing, simply reply to this message and put remove in the subject. 99 million email addresses for only $99. Spam or ham? Pretty good deal though. Maybe you want the deal. Well, maybe not. Um, last one. Okay, I know this is blatantly off topic, but I'm beginning to go insane. Uh, OT? Is that off topic? Let's just say OT. This is blatantly OT, but I'm beginning to go insane. Had an old Dell Dimension XPS sitting in the corner and decided to put it to use. I know it was working pre being stuck in the corner, but when I plugged it in, hit the power, nothing happened. Spam or ham? Seems likely a friend emailing you has no clue about how to get their computer to work. Um, maybe you want some help. Maybe you don't want to help him. You still don't want to see it. Um, subjective, but maybe this could be labeled as ham. It's a difficult question. It could be different for every person what this is. Ultimately, you'd start from a data set like this where things are labeled. The question is, can we from that learn how to label future emails? Here's another example, digit recognition. Maybe you're at the postal office, you want to recognize zip codes. Maybe you're a bank, you want to recognize digits on a check, and so forth. So what's the input here? The input is images, which are pixel grids. So you have a pixel grid here, maybe something like 16 by 20 or something, pixel grid. Um, and that's your input to the system. The output would be a digit from 0 through 9. The setup would be similar. You first get a large collection of example images, each labeled with a digit. So again, somebody has to go in and do this work. That's the assumption here. Then you want to learn to predict labels of new future digit images for which nobody had provided a label yet. So what could be features here? Maybe you say, well, when pixel 6,8 is on, that is indicative of one or the other digit, so I want that as a feature. Maybe every one of the pixels could be a feature that you use. Shape patterns. Maybe you could have, write something that counts the number of connected components, that looks at the aspect ratio of your digit, that looks at the number of loops that are present, and feed that all into your system to make decisions based on that. So this would be zero, one, two, one, and this one probably not so clear, maybe a two, who knows. Those things can show up too. Sometimes you can determine those from context, of course. If you're just given this, it might be hard. Somebody had other digits they've written. You see that this is similar to another two that they wrote. You might know what this is. There are many other examples. We looked at spam. We looked at optical character recognition. Medical diagnosis. You might be given a lot of symptoms. You want to classify what disease the patient has. Automatic essay grading. Students write essays. You're a professor. You don't like grading. Who likes that anyway? and you write a classifier that just grades for you. Turns out this is possible. A lot of essays these days get graded by a computer. Not that you can grade every piece of written work with a computer, but some of it can. Fraud detection. Whenever you have a credit card transaction, 
the credit card company will look at that transaction and try to classify it as fraud or a proper transaction. In fact, you probably have gotten messages where they check in with you and say, did you really make this transaction because they're worried somebody stole the credit card and they know they'll need to cover it for you. That's part of the deal when you sign up for a credit card. If it gets stolen, somebody does a transaction, they'll cover it for you. And so they have machine learning in place to detect these things as quickly as possible. Email routing beyond just spam or ham, it could be topically and so forth. In fact, classification is one of the most important AI technologies that's out there in the world and being used in many, many, many places. So let's look at a way to do classification. Let's start with the topic for today, which is model-based classification. So the model-based approach, you build a model for your data. You try to understand what your data is like. So we know one type of model that we can build, a base net. And so the base net would contain all the features that we just talked about, as well as the label given to that example. Right? And so we have a base net, variables correspond to features and label. Then what we can do is any feature that is observed, we can consider an evidence variable. And then we can run a probabilistic inference query and see what the most likely label is associated with that set of feature values. Of course, there are some challenges. What should the structure of the base net be? And how are we going to learn the parameters in the base net? OK, let's look at that. So naive base is a very specific type of base net that looks like this. And it's a topic of today's lecture. It is very naive in that look at how many assumptions it makes. It assumes that there's Y is the label. It assumes that once you pick a label, the value of feature one is conditionally dependent given the label of all other features. Same for feature two, same for feature three, and so forth. So very strong assumptions here. But that's the set of assumptions it makes, and actually it's remarkably capable despite making such strong assumptions. So let's take a look at this. So all features are assumed independent. Let's assume we're looking at digit recognition, and we have one feature variable per pixel. Then what that would say is, if you look at your grid, let's say this is our grid, and we decide whether certain pixels are colored in or not. First thing we do is we say, What's the label? Well, let's say we're marking in a one, the number one. Then once we decide that we're marking in the number one, we can decide whether or not the top pixel here is shaded or not. For a one, maybe not. And we go pixel by pixel, decide independently whether to color it in. Now, if we color in this one, and this one, and this one, it's quite likely that we want to keep going down here. But this model has no way of capturing that, actually. Because if your ones are sometimes mostly located in this column, sometimes mostly in this column, then actually this model doesn't really understand the concept of a running column where you fill everything in. So strong assumptions. So you might be a little turned off by all these assumptions, but we'll see that actually there's a very powerful method that can get us pretty far. So we understand the assumptions. This is what our feature vector would look like when we think about um, pixels for a digit. And we could maybe assume they're all binary valued, either on or off. You could also have something where they're grayscale. That's really a decision you make when you decide what your features are. And then the joint probability is given by this equation over here, joint probability of feature values and label. We've chosen the structure. It's fixed. So what we still need to figure out is the parameters in this network. So here's the general model. We have a joint distribution. And we're going to assume it can be factored in this particular way corresponding to this structure over here. Let's remind ourselves of why we might want to do that. Let's say we represent this distribution as a tabular uh, distribution. What we would have in terms of number of uh, entries in the table, we'd have for y, maybe we have 10 possible labels, because it's digits. Then for F1, there is on or off, and so forth, all the way till Fn. So we'd have 10 times 
2 to the n entries in our joint distribution. This is a very large number. And to figure out what all these values should be, it's very, very hard. On this side over here, we have 10 times, let's see. Um, then here, we need to decide, actually not 10 times. We have independently 10 values for this, and then two values, n times, that we need to choose over there. Actually, slightly more than that, because, well, it depends how you count. There will be a value for each digit, so we have a conditional. We have the probability given, so for f1, we have probability f1 equals on, given y equals zero, same for y equals one, and so forth. So we have 10 values per feature that we need to come up with, and then we can do that independently, so it's 10 times 10, um, and actually here, the, so we have ultimately roughly 1,000 entries, oh sorry, 10 times n, so we have linear in n number of entries here, whereas over here we have a number of parameters that's exponential in n, which is typically impractical, so we'll have lots and lots of features. Okay, so that's why we want to do this. Um, once we start learning these parameters, rather than just being worried about can we specify an exponential number of parameters which we need to do here, the question becomes one of statistical efficiency. So just put that on the slide here, something to start thinking about. What is the statistical efficiency of your representation? If you only need to estimate a small number of parameters from data, you might only need a small amount of data. If you need to estimate a large number of parameters, you're going to typically need a lot of data to estimate those parameters. And so the beauty here is once we assume naive Bayes, number of parameters very low, so probably on a small amount of data, we can estimate this model quite well. How do we inference in this model? So let's say somebody gave you a naive Bayes model and you're given some digit, a scan of a digit, pixel values, so you can extract your feature values here. Then you can compute the joint distribution between each possible label value and each feature, the combination of feature values, which is just given by this set of equations over here. What is this saying? It's saying for a specific instantiation of all variables in the base net, I need to multiply together the corresponding conditional probability entries in the base net. That's what this equation is doing. Um, this gives us, for digits, 10 resulting probabilities, joint probabilities of a specific digit being there with the specific pixel values. And then we can just look at which one is the highest and say that is the most likely number that's in this scan. If you want to get the actual probabilities, of course, you need to renormalize here to get probabilities out. Okay, that's the generic approach. So we just saw how to do inference in a naive based model. It's really the standard inference procedure. It's so simple because only one variable that's not observed. It's a very, very simple thing to run inference in. Nothing new there. What we'll need to start worrying about is the model and how we get the parameters for the model. So we have the prior for the labels. How do we get that? We have this conditional independence assumption that each feature is independent of other features given the label. How do we get those probabilities? Combined, all of those entries we'll call our parameter vector theta. So theta is, a, is this huge vector that contains all the parameters in your base net. Until now in 188, we've assumed that somebody brings those to us, those parameters, but that's going to change in this lecture. So let's look at some example conditional probabilities. Here is the digit classification task again. Maybe the prior is equal, uniform over all digits. Is that the right prior? Who knows? It's something you could assume. Anybody any thoughts if this would be a good prior or not? Some people nodding no. Why is that? Okay, so I should clarify. We're just looking at the prior here, not at, at the not at the 
posterior once we've seen the, the scan. Over there. I think there's some sort of um, informal rule that like the numbers have some log distribution. So like one occurs like 30% of the time and 220. Like in most of like in some statistical data. Mm -hmm. Correct. So it turns out in most data, ones will appear a lot more often than twos, a lot more than threes, and so forth. And the reason that is because most numbers when they appear is because some amount is going up. And so as numbers go up, the first thing that will appear is the one. And then when you go from, let's say, needing only one digit to needing two digits, the first thing that will happen is a one up front and only later the two. Again, when you go from two to three digits, same thing will happen and so forth. So for monetary amounts, bank account numbers and so forth, a one will appear a lot more often than a two. And actually people do tests like this. If somebody likes to check whether numbers are real or not, whether they're real data or somebody might have made them up, they might check for things like that. Does the one indeed appear more often than a two? Because if not, probably made up data from, by somebody who doesn't know this. Um, if it's zip codes, they might be equally distributed because just that's the way people want to set it up to have a, each digit appear about the same amount of time. Now, this nevertheless, in our example here, will be the prior. We'll assume that each digit is equally likely. But again, this is something you need to figure out in your problem setting. Then we have conditional distributions. For each feature, what's the condition of this pixel being on given it's a three? Maybe um, for a three, it's a low probability, 5% chance of being on. For a zero, it's pretty high probability and so forth. So that's a table you need to build for every one of your pixels. That's the pixel scenario. How about text? Um, if we have some text, and the most straightforward thing to look at would be words that appear in the text, right? Then we could check for each word in a document Say that that's a feature, and the feature will encode which word is appearing in spot one, spot two, spot three, and so forth. Right? And so we'd have a model that's a joint distribution between the topic of your document and then what word one is going to be up to word n. Question? Do you generate the priors from your training data? We'll look at that, absolutely. Now, if you look at this model over here, some question. Um, if you look at this model over here, is this a good model for text? Is this how text gets generated? Let's think about this. You pick a topic, let's say, I don't know, politics or something, then you pick your first word, given you pick the topic, pick some word. Bernie, okay, you pick Bernie, there we go. <laughs> then what this thing is saying that, now word two is independent of word one, given that you picked the topic politics. <laughs> That's actually unlikely to be true. It's quite likely that the second word would be Sanders in that particular case, or something feeling something, I don't know. <laughs> um, but this model doesn't capture that. Nevertheless, this is the model we're going to be using, and so it depends. If you want to do essay grading with this kind of model, whether it is a very, very good essay versus a very bad essay, it's not going to work out. Because somebody who actually changes, like lets the second word not depend on the first word, that's going to be a very poorly written essay. But that's what we're using, and if all you want to do is classify whether a document is about politics versus sports, it might actually work just fine. Because it doesn't really matter what the dependence exactly is between the words. If a lot of politics word appears, then it's going to be politics. Okay, so important. This is not the ith word in the dictionary. It's not saying, is the ith word in my dictionary present or not? It's saying, what is the ith word in my document? And if you have a dictionary of, let's say, 100,000 words, then it's essentially saying which of those 100,000 words appears in spot one, which of the 100,000 words appears in spot two, and so forth. Now, beyond making the naive Bayes assumption, so this is the naive Bayes assumption up here, which we already talked about, that once you pick your first word, the second word doesn't depend on that, it still just only depends on the topic. 
people often make an additional assumption. This assumption of tied distribution, which is also called the bag of words in this context. What that means is that the conditional probability of the word at position one being some word given the label is the same as the probability for that word at when it's at position two, three, four. So you make the assumption that there's no dependence on where you are in the document, what the distribution over words is going to be. A very strong assumption. Again, why would you make this assumption? <laughs> this is for statistical efficiency. Because what that means is that if you are willing to make this assumption, the number of distributions you need to infer to set up this model is only two distributions. You need a distribution for the prior over possible topics, and then you need a conditional distribution over word given topic. And so it's a very small number of parameters that you either need to come up with from your head or through learning from data. You of course need to think about whether that works for your system or not, but often the game is one of how many assumptions can you make such that it's still compatible with the thing you're trying to do? Because if you make a lot of assumptions that are compatible with what you're trying to achieve, you might need very small amounts of data that's labeled to still achieve your task. So let's look at an example of what happens in spam filtering. So let's assume we use a bag of words model where the condition of word given topic is the same for every position. What are the parameters? What is our prior? Probability of spam versus ham. Hard to say. You'd have to kind of get some estimate of how often this thing appears maybe. There's actually an actual machine learning data set that we're referring to here. That one had 66% ham, 33% spam. Then we can also start looking at what's the probability of each word given spam, each word given ham. Let's sort them. What do you think is the most likely word given spam? Free. Free. Reasonable guess, right? Over there. The. The. Because a lot of spammers will write does. What do people think? The or free? A uh, little bit torn? And this data said the is first. Then to, then and, then off, you, a, with, from. Actually, not very much here is indicative of spam at all. For ham, quite similar. Um, not sure about the 2002. Because <laughs> a lot of people were very punctual, maybe, about certain things. Well, part of it is that the data set was collected. This data set was collected back in 98 through 2002. So that's part of why that number appears. But it's very interesting to look at this. If you look at what's going on, the most likely word in each case is the. If we start thinking about how does a naive base make its decisions? Okay, it actually doesn't make its decisions just based on which words are likely. What really happens is you compute this product here. What happens is you would compute probability of ham and probability of spam. And then when the first word comes in, you would say, well, what's the probability of word one, maybe the, given, given ham? And you have the probability of the given spam. And then you'd have the next word coming in. Let's say the next word was the lecture. Um, not a very common word, probably, but let's just assume that. Lecture given ham, lecture given spam. And you'd keep building this up. Let's say this was just a two word long document that just said the lecture. Then you would compute two numbers here, the product of these three numbers each time, and compare how large they are. Really, when you start thinking about it, what matters is the ratio between these. Is ham or spam more likely? Is the more likely when it's ham than well when it's spam? And same thing here, because the way each word contributes to the decision is by the ratio of its probability when it's one category versus the other category. So you can see here that the, because it's slightly more likely with ham than with spam, the will slightly favor in this calculation that it might be ham. Lecture is not in this list. I don't know where it would end up, but each one of those words contributes by their probability ratio, not directly by their probabilities. We still have to worry about where these tables come from. We'll get to that uh, really soon. 
So let's look at an example. You're a spam classifier. A document comes in, an email comes in, you try to decide. First thing you do is you look at the prior. If you don't know anything about it, your prior says most likely ham. That's the probability here, two thirds. Now, when we're going to tally things here, the naive thing to tally things would be to take a product. You would multiply it together just like what this equation says over here. The problem with probabilities is they're all smaller than one here. So, and a lot of them are much smaller than one. So if you just multiply things together, we'll end up with a tally here that at least as it fits on the slide will be only zeros. And then something in the very end will be non-zero. And in fact, even if you do this on a computer, your computer might run out of sufficient accuracy and you might not, they might both become zero and you have no idea what actually you need to decide. So instead of keeping track of this quantity over here, we're going to keep track of the log of that because the log will help us rescale things away from zero and allow us to do things more easily. So when we look at things, we're going to look at not the actual probability, but the log of the log of this thing over here. Actually, the calculation becomes very simple because the log of a product is the sum of the logs. So it'll be log of PY plus then sum over I log probability of word I given Y. Okay? That's how we calculate this. So what you see here is the log probabilities. And so for the first one, this is just the log probability of prior, then here, next one, we look at the log probability, the log of this, the log of this, and we add it on to what's already here to keep a running tally as we go along to see what the total log probability is. Gary, now we see um, Ham is favored at this point, Ham is still favored after Wood, and we kind of keep going. This one has a ratio that's the other way around, would favor spam, and we keep tallying all the way through, ultimately we end up with a probability. How do we get this probability over here? So first let's take a look at this. This is the final, this is, this thing here is log probability of spam given all the words, word one through word n, and same for the other one for ham. Sorry, it's log probability of the joint, sorry. Got, not conditional, log probability of the joint between the label and all features. And this one is the log probability also of the joint between ham and all the words that were observed. Once we have the log probability of the joint, we can figure out what the actual probabilities are of the joint. So we can define the probability here would be equal to e to the negative 80.5 and same thing here the probability would be equal to e to the negative 76.0 and then we renormalize to get out the conditional probability of each of the labels given the evidence it's the way we found um, this thing over here 98 so 0 0.989 is equal to e to the this is for ham so e to the negative 80 0.5 divided by e to the negative 80.5 plus e to the negative 76.0. And that's how we get the 98.9 percent. .9%. Question? Should we what? Because this is a negative 80.5. So these are all negative numbers. And the reason they're all negative numbers is the log of a number below 1 will be negative. When we add it together, it keeps getting negative. Why do we use half? Why do we use what? Half. Like, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Why do we use, why do we use a percentage here? Or the negative 80.5. Oh, these are not percentages. So these are actually the log. So this Negative 80.5 is literally the log of probability of ham jointly with all the words. There's no percentage sitting there. Oh, I see what you're saying. We want the other one. So then we would want one minus this thing. Correct. So you're saying we want the 
other number. So we want, in this case, the 76 at the top because we're looking at the uh, spam one. Correct. Thank you. Okay, let's take a break here and let's start looking at training and testing after the break. First, an observation here. Looking, actually, let's see, are there any questions about the first half? So, observation here 98.9% .9 probability is spam. Give you the words you've seen so far, right? If you look at that number, you've seen about 10 words, maybe a pretty common proof, something about losing weight, probably somebody trying to sell something to you. But it's still a very interesting lesson here. An interesting lesson that this thing is super, super confident about it being spam. Any thoughts why this might be happening? And how this might relate to how we're doing classification here? So here's, here's what's happening. Let's say you set up a naive Bayes model, which is what we did, right? Let's put one up. Here's a naive Bayes model. In a naive Bayes model, we assume that feature two is independent of feature one given the label. Feature three is independent of feature one, and feature two given the label, and so forth. So it makes some very strong initial independent assumptions. What that means is that we might be double counting our evidence as we do inference. Because, for example, if two words always appear together, and so when the first word appears, it's guaranteed the other word is going to come after that. If those two words are indicated with some kind of topic, they'll now independently contribute to the odds ratio. Even though the second word really shouldn't contribute anymore because it's just a consequence of the previous word, right? For example, um, it's typically not exactly true, but let's say, let's say in a naive Bayes model, let's do something extreme. You have a document. You now copy and paste that document and you have twice the same document. So 100 words document, you paste it again, you have other 100 words that are identical, now your naive Bayes model will be far more confident that it's on that topic than if you only have the first 100 words. Because it just thinks this is all independent. If it is wondering whether something is about politics, if it sees Bernie and then sees Sanders, it sees it as two completely independent pieces of evidence, even though they're actually not independent at all. And so what often happens with this kind of model is that you become way overconfident about what it is that you think it is. So you actually can often not trust the probabilities that come out of this because your assumptions are so strong. But nevertheless, it can often make the right decision. It can favor the correct classification. It might just not favor it with the right probability, not a very well calibrated estimate of the probability of that particular outcome. So now let's take a look at what is the most important thing in machine learning. And we'll start with an illustrative example. As a student, you come to lecture. This is the equivalent of what we'll call training. It's not just lecture, it's also projects and homework. That's training. Then you get the practice exam, which you check how well did your training work out for you. You see how well you do. That might then be indicative of telling you what will happen in the real world when you take a real exam. This is called our holdout data in machine learning. And this will be called our test data. And so just looking at this, a lot of the concepts are captured in this cartoon. If you before you do your training, or during your training, look at the practice exam and think about it and go back to your training sessions, look at the practice exam again, keep repeating this, and then after that, you take your practice exam, 
your performance might not be all that representative of how you're going to do on the actual exam because it's not the same condition. You've been sneak peeking at your practice exam and as a consequence you're able to do better. Same thing will be true for what we're doing. We're going to be, have to be very careful as we look at our data system, we split it into train, hold, and test, hold out, and test, that we're careful about what it means to peek at the data. And you might also realize that if somebody somehow publishes the actual exam the day before the exam, all of you are going to do a lot better. I mean, at least everybody who looks at it is going to do a lot better because you can look at it ahead of time. And so to be indicative of how well you would do, let's say, in the wild, working at Google, Facebook, doing AI for them, it's actually critical that the exam is not published before you take the test. Same thing here. You run a machine learning algorithm. You don't want to use your test data until the very, very end to evaluate how well you did with your machine learning algorithm. And then you want to use it only once. If you use it more than once, it's not going to be indicative anymore because now you can, if you use it once, go back, tweak your machine learning setup, and then test again. All of a sudden, not representative anymore of what things would be like out in the wild on real data. This is the most important thing in machine learning. It's also the most common thing people will do wrong because they'll be like, I, I should sneak at this other data a little bit too and then you get better performance on that other data. Ultimately, you're doing really, really well on this other data, but actually it's useless because you're overfitting. You're fitting something specific to that other data, not a general pattern. So when we get data, Let's say you are working in machine learning, right? You get a data set and you want to show a capability of your learning algorithm, of how good it would be in the wild. You will split it into training data, holdout data, test data. Again, test data you don't get to do anything with, except at the very end when you think you're done, you get to use it once and declare how you did. In fact, often how does it set up? You don't even get to see your test data. Has anybody heard of Kaggle? Some people have heard of Kaggle, right? So Kaggle is a, machine, is a hosting service for machine learning competitions. If you have a data set and you want somebody other than you to run machine learning with that data set and maybe learn a spam versus ham classifier or a digit classifier, you could provide the data with labels and then Kaggle will hold back the test data. They never pan out the test data. They only give you a small data set some fraction of the data that you get to work with, then you ultimately submit into their competition. When the competition is over, everybody has submitted, they run once on the test data and they declare the winner. <coughs> right? They also have a leaderboard which looks at some, what you can think of it as holdout data where you can intermediately see how you would likely do on the test data, but it's not the actual test data. That is only used at the very, very end. Excuse me. Excuse me, over there. Excuse me, it's really difficult to give a lecture if somebody is talking at the same time. All right, if you're talking with me, it's fine. But if you're talking with your friend, it's really distracting. Do you want to talk about this or? OK, thank you. So if you submit into Kaggle, you might actually win a prize. Like it's something if you like machine learning, you could actually make money submitting into those competitions. You can also be hired at places by putting on your resume where you are in the Kaggle leaderboard, things like that. And in fact, the 189 class at Berkeley, which is all on machine learning, often uses Kaggle competitions as your actual project and homework. So your homework is submitting into the Kaggle competition and where you land will determine your grade and maybe you make some money along the way, who knows. Um, um, so keep that in mind, 189, very interesting. So what should we be thinking about here? First thing when we get our data set, we need to think about features. What are some things about the data that matter that we might want to use in our naive based model? Once we've extracted that, those features are going to characterize how our model deals with the data. Then we have an experimentation cycle. We learn parameters, for example, for naive Bayes, you look at the data. From the data, you estimate the parameters in the model. The next step is to tune hyperparameters on the holdout set. What does that mean? This is still very abstract at this point. It will become more concrete soon. What that means is you have your training data. Maybe you run counts on your training data to determine how often each thing co-occurs. Once you've run the counts, you use that as your parameters. That would be one naive way to get parameters. And then you check on data you have not used to compute your counts, 
that's your holdout data and see how well you do. If you don't do so well, you might say, well, using counts is not that great. Maybe I should use a different way of finding the parameters. And you find a different way of finding parameters. Again, then you look at the holdout data, see how well you do, and repeat. And so this process, this is a cycle here where you go back and forth between doing training on your training data, checking on your holdout data, how well you do, and then maybe not being happy with it and repeating. Actually, often what you do is you fire up a ton of processes where each process does its own training, and then all these report back how well they do on your holdout data, and you might pick the one that does best on your holdout data. Important though, you cannot peek at the test set at this point. You can only look at your holdout data. Because once you look at your test set, it, it's not going to be representative anymore how you report later. For evaluation, you then look at the accuracy in your test data, and that would then be representative of how things would be in the wild, assuming data in the wild comes from a similar distribution as the data you have here. This is not always the case. Imagine you're running a spam filter, and you trained it really well, you were very, very careful about this, there's holdout data, test data, you're doing really well, but maybe spammers understand what you're doing and then change how they spam, and you need to retrain and go again. So in, in the real world, this can be more complicated often if somebody is generating data for you, or against you in this case. The key thing to be worried about is whether you're overfitting or not, and whether you're generalizing or not. What you want is a classifier that does really well on the test data, data that you'll see in the future, not the data that's in your training set. That doesn't matter how well you do on that data. Of course, it's going to be hopefully representative of how well you do on the test set, but that's really the question we're after, how to use training and holdout data to do well on test data. Let's look at a simple example. So we'll worry about Generalization and overfitting. Generalization means doing well on data you have not seen before. Overfitting means doing really well on the data you've seen, but not so well on data you've not seen yet. Okay, here's an example of a bunch of points. Can we fit a pattern to this? We can see a pattern there, right? So what, do you, what would you fit to this? Like maybe you draw something, but that's hard for a computer to then do because you're the one drawing. Maybe you write a piece of code that fits something for you, right? What piece of code could fit something here? Maybe linear regression, right? You could say, let's fit the best line through this set of points. And then linear regression would maybe do something like this. You might say, well, not so hot on this. This thing is ignoring like this wavy pattern. I want something a little better that follows that pattern a little more closely. Say, well, maybe you fit um, a polynomial where you say it's going to be something of the form a0 plus a1, actually let's call them theta, because we always call them theta here, theta0 plus theta1x plus theta1x squared. I'm going to find then the best theta0, theta1, oh, this should be theta2, best settings of theta0, theta1, theta2, that might kind of work through this, and maybe you get something like this that you like better, who knows. Then you could say, well, uh, maybe I want actually also plus theta 3 times x to the third. And maybe it'll fit even better, right? And so that's what you do as you're running machine learning. You're kind of changing your model, changing things that you're doing, and then you're checking how well you're doing. Right here, all we're looking at is the, the data set in front of us. If we go very extreme, we could say, well, let's fit a degree 15 polynomial to this. That's what you get. Um, if you look at this, you should be very unhappy because you should think, well, this is probably a bad prediction over here and this is probably a bad prediction over here. So this degree 15 polynomial, to be able to fit all the data, it had to do something kind of crazy. So we don't want this. If we think back to the paradigm that we set up over here, training data, holdout data, test data, what that means is that when you look at this, if this is our data set, you would dedicate some points that you don't use for the fitting. You'd be fitting a line, a polynomial, and so forth, but you'd say, you know what, I'm not gonna fit maybe randomly selected this point, this point, this point, and this point, I'm gonna call that holdout data. Those four points. And you're only gonna look at the other points. You're going to now fit a curve through the other points, first a line, then a parabola, then a third-order polynomial, you keep going, 
And then if you look at the, let's say, 15 order polynomial fit to the, just the training points, not the holdout points, you'll see that it does very poorly on the holdout points, and you can now quantify that actually it was a bad decision to use your 15th order polynomial because it's overfitting to the training data, not doing well on the holdout data. You might say, why would we do this? We can just look at this and eyeball it. It's clear that this is a bad fit, but in reality, you're going to be fitting things in very high dimensions. It's going to be, instead of a one-dimensional feature space X, it's going to be maybe a million-dimensional feature space. And there's no way for you to visualize and look at what you fit and say, oh my God, it looks a little squiggly here. I don't think I like this one. You're gonna need something quantifiable. And so in practice, what would happen in this kind of small, is this small scale example, if you ran this in like how you'd run a bigger scale example, you'd say, you'd say, let's loop over, let's say order polynomials from one through 20. Let's send the training data and the holdout data to 20 different servers. Each server runs a curve fit for their order of polynomial, then checks accuracy in the holdout data, reports that back, we check whichever one did the best, and that's probably the one we would use, and check how well that does on our test data. Question. Very good question. So is there any theory or rule of thumb that tells you why we might have drawn this in this proportion over here? The rule of thumb is something like 70, 30 percent. This is, I mean, this is just a rule of thumb. But there's also some theory that exists that essentially relates also to how often you're going to look at your holdout data. So when I described the pattern here, right, I said we're going to fit a polynomial, and then we're going to check accuracy in the holdout data. Fitting a polynomial, we're doing an enormous amount of the work with the training data. We're looking at it in great detail, to, great detail to find these parameters, theta 0, theta 1, and so forth. And so you're using your training data very extensively. And your holdout data, you only use to check an accuracy. And you don't change your parameters anymore. And so that's why we need less holdout data, because we're not really tuning to it so, in so much detail and we want most of the data to be training data. But then the more things you do, if you set up something with, let's say, a billion things that, billion models you're gonna compute and compare in your holdout data, then maybe you need more holdout data than 30%. Maybe you need like 40% or even more. There are also games people play where they actually do things, this is called, um, um, well, k-fold, where k is a number, cross-validation. And so if, you, if you're testing a lot of models, you might do something like that, where what you do is you say, I'm going to make multiple splits. So I'm going to take my data and do a 90% training data, 10% test data, uh, holdout data split, and I'm going to repeat that 10 times. And so that's another way to leverage your data even more than just doing this one split. And that way you can actually shift more. In the extreme, you would put 99.9% .9 in your training data, just one holdout point, but then you have to repeat it many, many times, of course, to evaluate this properly. That would be hold one out cross-validation. And that'd be computationally more expensive, so that's a trade-off, but would be the extreme case of maximally using your, your data as train and hold out data. Question here. Wouldn't your model then be biased towards the holdout data? So that's a good question. Will your model be biased towards the holdout data? If you, if you run this procedure that we just described, right? Would you end up with a degree five polynomial or degree six will be largely determined by your holdout data, more so than by your training data. Um, but the hope is that they come from a similar distribution and that overall you have enough data that this will work out and that you essentially can understand when you are overfitting and when you are still fitting the, the general pattern in your data. Um, but you definitely need to be very careful about overfitting to your holdout data. Because the extreme would be, instead of, instead of just, the extreme case would be instead of sending out the data to 20 servers that each do a order one through 20 polynomial fitting, and then look at the holdout data, you could say, well, when I look at the holdout data, I'm gonna also allow it to still change the parameters a little bit to fit the holdout data better, and then report accuracy, and then you're really overfitting your holdout data. But an intermediate would be something where you say, I'm sending out not just to 20 servers, but I'm sending it out to many more servers where this server has to keep theta zero between 
0 and 0 0.1 and can only fit in that range. And this server has to keep theta 0 between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, then effectively you're spreading it so thin that your holdout data is doing the fitting. So the overarching idea is that you need to split your data into train and holdout. You fit your parameters on the training data and then verify on the holdout data how well you're doing. The reason you do it is because you typically don't know what model you want to use, which order of polynomial you're going to use or should be using. So here's an example of overfitting in the extreme, just to illustrate a point. Um, we're going to classify this thing over here using naive Bayes. Okay. Um, and we're going to just compare whether it's a 2 or a 3. Prior for features, C equal 2, C equal 3. So we have probability of a 2, probability of a 3. So far, so good. Then we look at this pixel over there. We'll look at all of them, but in the slide, only add a few of them to illustrate the point. What's the probability of this thing being on given class is 2, 0 0.8. Given class is 3, also 0 0.8. Ratio is 1. We still don't know how to distinguish at this point. Next one actually favors 3 by a ratio of 9 in favor of 3. So now we're ed edging towards 3. This one favors also 3 because a 2 would, would not so often have, a 2 would have this filled in, but we're looking at the probability of off. And so this favors 3 again. And so, so far so good. Actually, let's go till here. So far so good, we're favoring 3. Now let's look at the bottom pixel here. It turns out our model thinks probability of that being on, given that it's a 3, is 0. We multiply into 0, or if we look at the odd ratio, odds ratios, it'll be infinity in favor of the 2, and we're done. It's always going to be a 2, despite all the evidence we collected so far. So any probability that is a 0 is really dangerous to have. How could this end up being a 0? Well, if we naively looked at all the 3s in our data set, checked how often that pixel was filled in, and we saw it was never filled in, we might have given it a probability of zero. But is it really the case because we've never seen it in our data set that it never could be filled in? Maybe not. And in fact, here it is, and we wish it would still classify it as a three. So you need to be, that is an extreme case of overfitting, where you're saying, I've never seen this, so I give it a probability of zero. Okay, so let's look at some posteriors for classification, if we look at the bag of words model on that data set that we've been using so far, probability of the, a word given ham versus probability of a word given span. And we know that the thing that's going to contribute the most to ham is the thing that has the highest ratio here and the other way around for span. So we can sort our words, our features. When you run a naive base, you can sort your features by odds ratios, see how extreme they are, and that indicates to you which are really the features that are going to make the difference in this decision. So let's look at this. For ham, apparently Southwest nation morally nicely extends seriously all of an inf infinite odds ratio, meaning they never appeared in the spam data set. And so now whenever those words appear, if you naively use counts, you end up with always being in favor of ham, all the way around here. So clearly we want to avoid this kind of extreme overfitting. So we don't want this. We don't want zero probabilities. In general, we don't want overfitting. So relative frequency parameters, it's what we have used in the example so far, will overfit the training data. You will detect this on your holdout data, most likely. Um, so first example, first bullet point, then next one's next slide. But in general, the issue here is that we don't want zero probability for anything, because it's just going to have too strong a force putting things in one direction. Okay, now let's think about overfitting for a moment also. If you were to use the entire email as one feature, it's like, if the email exactly looks like this, it's a feature one. If the email looks exactly like this other email, then feature two is on. If this email looks exactly like yet another email, then feature three is on. Then when you train your naive base, it'll do really, really well on the training data because whenever always only a single feature will be on, it'll be related to the one classification it has. You'll get perfect accuracy in your training data, but your features are too 
too detailed and don't allow for generalization. So it could be overfitting because you introduce zeros, it could be overfitting because your features are too specific and you're just like in the 15th order polynomial, the 15th power of x, probably not something you wanted to use in that fit. Same thing here, an entire email in detail as one feature, it's not what you want to use as a feature. So we need to do something about this to get better estimates. That's a parameter estimation problem. So let's say you want to estimate the distribution of a random variable. First thing we can do is say, well, just ask somebody. And say, well, what's the probability of red or blue? You might look at this thing and say, well, one third, two thirds, who knows? But it's hard to do, especially when there's a lot of probabilities to be estimated. So empirically, we could just use training data. We could say, let's just look at counts. So what's the empirical rate? If this is our, if we pulled three balls out of that bucket, we saw two reds, one blue, we could say, well, two thirds red, one third blue, that's our estimate for the entire bowl, the entire uh, world distribution. So it's just a count of something divided by the total number of samples. Very, very simple. This is the estimate that also maximizes the likelihood of the data. Really important concept. This is something new. What are we looking at here? The likelihood of the data, so the likelihood of some data x under some parameter values theta is the product of the probabilities of each of the individual data points that you get under that parameter vector theta. So for example, if theta corresponds to um, probability of red, and then one minus theta would be probability of blue, then the likelihood of that data would be equal to theta times theta times one minus theta, which is equal to theta squared minus theta minus theta to the third. A natural thing we could do is we could say to find the good theta, we can say, well, we saw the data, we know how likely the data is as a function of theta. Let's find the theta that makes this data set maximally likely. So we'll say which theta maximizes theta squared minus theta to the third. How do we find that? One way to find is set the derivative equal to zero. A function achieves an extremum when a derivative is equal to zero. So we could say, well, what is dl d theta, which is equal to two theta minus three theta squared. Okay, and we want to set this equal to zero. And this thing is equal to also um, theta times two minus three theta. So this is zero when theta equals zero. That's actually a minimum. That's not what we want. It makes it least likely, the data. And then it's also zero when theta equals two thirds. And that is the maximum. That's what achieves the highest likelihood of the data. Nice thing about this, this is a general principle. No matter what probabilistic model you put forward that has some free parameters, you could write out the probability of your training data under that model, find the parameters that maximize it, and then those will be the parameters you choose. Then maybe you take another model, a base net that has different edges and so forth, you do this again, find the parameters for that one, and then for each one of them, you check on your holdout data, which one achieves the higher likelihood, and that's the one you would go with. Last worry about overfitting. So the reason this robot is actually happy despite being in a scary situation is because he knew this could happen. He's prepared uh, to see the monster. He did not give it zero probability. Sasha dates back to Laplace, long time ago, French mathematician. He's, he was thinking about what is the probability that the sun doesn't rise tomorrow? You might say that's a very low probability. But is it really zero probability or should it be something different than zero? I think most of would say zero might not be the right number. It's gonna be close to zero, but who knows? So how to deal with these kind of things? If all you do is looking at the maximum likelihood estimate, you just do what we've done so far, this thing over here. What you actually want to do is to look at what is the most likely parameter theta, maximum a posteriori meaning, accounting for the fact that you might have some prior information. So you might say, rather than just looking at the likelihood, which is this thing over here, you introduce a prior that you multiply in. You're applying Bayes' rule here. You say, I put a prior on theta. I know no parameters should be zero. That's not good. You can put that in, you can apply Bayes' rule and maximize this quantity that appears in Bayes' rule rather than just maximizing the likelihood of your data. And so 
since this thing does not depend on theta, it doesn't matter, we can leave it out. And so you would maximize this thing over here rather than just px given theta is px given theta times the prior over theta. You apply prior that puts zero probability on theta being zero anywhere, you avoid all the zeros. What will this give? You have to do some math depending on the situation. Um, let's see, we have one minute left and we have a topic that takes five slides. That's not gonna work. Let's do this next time. See you on Thursday.